Are you tired of advertisements? You can listen to this episode and more ad-free for only $1 a month by supporting the show on Patreon. Visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and hit the Patreon tab for more details. It's a pleasure to have you back with us here tonight, and I have an excellent show slated for this evening. A plethora of hair-raising, spine-tingling tales. And one of these entries just might be one of the most intense calls I've shared to date. But before we do that, I have all sorts of listener-submitted stories to disperse, dissect, and deliberate. And to kick us off this evening, we venture to the state of Virginia, where Bryce is waiting with tonight's first entry. Hey Derek, hey Sarah. My name is Bryce. I live in Williamsburg, Virginia, the colonization of Jamestown area. My school is called Jamestown. Me and my father, we have a boat and we live on the on the water, on the James River. We were um, going fishing before I went to my first year of college, so this was probably July or, or very early August, probably July of last year, 2022. So we, we were fishing. Uh, it was a very flat day on the water. I mean, it would have been a perfect day to go tubing if we didn't decide to go fishing. But we decided to go fishing just because it, it's been a while and we grew up fishing. We were just fishing for maybe an hour, and things were pretty good. We, we caught a fair amount of fish. I mean, it was a good day on the water. We were happy. We were have, sharing some beers, like father-son moment. We were having some fun. And then I was sitting at my reel, and I felt some giant tug my reel. I was like, holy So I, I start pulling as hard as I can. I mean, I'm not a... I'm not a strong guy. I'm not a weak guy either, though. I, it, it was it was a pretty hard thing to pull, and it was like p- pulling like against me. I couldn't tell if I was stuck on the bottom of the river or what was really happening. And so I uh, asked my dad to come take a hold, and the same thing was happening to him. And uh, we could gain. It, it's like we could gain the line, but we would lose it simultaneously. Like it would get pulled away, and we we sat and and did this for about five minutes and, and my dad was like i think you're stuck on like some seaweed and i was like dude like this does not feel like seaweed like i wouldn't be able to move at all and we were able to like fight this 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 line and then like practically out of nowhere like an eight foot tall wave comes and and it's about like it's about like five feet away from our boat and all of a sudden we just see this giant wave just coming towards us and, and it crashes over top of our boat i mean it was taller than our boat like it, cr- it crashed over top of it my my dad's beer flew out of his hand and it went all over the boat. Like things got jumped around the boat. I mean, this was a strong wave and keep in mind it's completely flat on the water that day. There's no wind. There's no reason for this wave to just simply occur. And as this wave occurred, it also snapped the line and we have no idea what it was very strange that a giant wave came out of nowhere. And it was almost like some giant sea creature like was pulling against it. And all of a sudden just with one little, but flap of his, his fins just created this mass eight foot wave. It was eight foot tall, maybe like 10 feet wide. I mean, it was a pretty big wave considering like where we live on the river. Uh, waves don't really get that big. It's just choppy when it's windy, but it was a very strange occurrence. And yeah, I just wanted to call in and share that. Ha- have a good one. Appreciate what you guys do. Bye. Thank you, Bryce. No, I feel like I mention this each time a call like this is shared, but it's true. We don't get too many water monster stories around here. But boy, do I get excited when they do come in. And I suppose I am jumping to conclusions here, claiming it to be a monster of some sort that disturbed Bryce and his father. He hardly even mentioned the notion that he thought it was a monster. Instead, he described it as a wave, 
a wave possibly caused by whatever it was on the other end of his fishing line. Well, there are plenty of known animals that could cause a ruckus of the described size in the waters of the James River. There are known exotic fish in the river. For example, a few specimen of northern snakehead, an aggressive aquarium fish native to Asia, has been found in the James. So is it possible that a larger species could be in there as well? I've also seen a video of a large constrictor snake of some sort in that very river. Although it's believed that the animal in that video is a quote-unquote supervised pet. But there have been reports of manatee and seal submitted over the years as well. Both rather large aquatic mammals. But there's one resident of the James River that I think perfectly fits Bryce's description. The Atlantic Sturgeon. Now this dinosaur of a fish can grow up to 15 feet long and weigh as much as 800 pounds. So I imagine if Bryce hooked into one of these large sturgeon, it would behave exactly the way he described. And sturgeon live and reproduce in the James. In fact, there's currently several programs in place to help protect and propagate the species. So all arrows seem to point to this massive fish as the culprit in the story. But not so fast, my friend. Sure, the sturgeon is the most likely candidate, but there's another regional creature that we should also, at the very least, take into consideration. But to do so, we need to follow the river to its outlet. The James River flows 348 miles east, where it spills out into the Atlantic Ocean, specifically the Chesapeake Bay. And that is where a legendary creature is said to haunt the waters. A creature known locally as Chessie. Chessie is said to live in the midst of the Chesapeake Bay, located in between Virginia and Maryland, USA. Most sightings describe the creature as a long, snake-like sea serpent, from anywhere between 25 and 40 feet long. Unlike other similar cryptid sightings, such as Nessie or Champ, Chessie possesses no flippers or limbs whatsoever, but is instead said to more closely resemble a giant eel or a sea snake, and is reported to be black or brown in colour. The earliest sighting of the creature is said to have taken place in 1936. Something reptilian and unknown in the water was observed by a crew of military personnel. Now that informative tidbit on behalf of Cryptid Central on YouTube. And the clip is only a small portion of a mini documentary found there at Cryptid Central's page. And the video is a pretty good way to learn more about this little known cryptid. So I implore you, go to the show notes and check it out. Now as for your experience, Bryce, that's a handful of viable candidates. Some scarier than others. But I bet each would be a thrill and a shock to encounter in the wild. Thank you again for reporting your brush with the strange and unusual. And if you have a story you would like to share here on the program, just give our hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 888-608-NIGHT or record your story on the Voice Memo app on your phone. Then email it to me at monstersamonguspodcast.com. And don't forget, we're looking for those government worker stories for the Season 17 premiere, and more hometown legends for the Season 16 finale. Now, folks, tonight's next entry is one that might make you question just how safe you are around spirits, ghosts, or apparitions. After all, if they can do this to Cody in Washington, what might they be capable of around you in your home? Welcome to the program, Cody. Hi, Derek. This is Cody from Marysville, Washington. I wanted to call this in as quickly as possible. It happened two days ago, so March 11th, uh, 2022. Me and my fiance were just relaxing for the night, watching a movie, 
and I felt this weird goosebump pattern on my leg or on my right shin. Thought nothing of it, wiped the goosebumps away, and then not too long after that it happened again. And I told my fiance that it kind of felt like a hand, like it was in the print of a hand. So I had her look, wiped them away, and probably 45 seconds to a minute later, it happened again, and she watched the form of a hand of goosebumps form on my right shin. I don't know what that could be. We did just recently lose a relative of mine who was very, very close to me a couple weeks ago. But I don't know if that would have anything to do with that. So, like I said, just something really quick. Wanted to call as quickly as I could to let you know. So I had all the details fresh in my mind. All right, thanks, Derek. Thank you, Cody. Now, believe it or not, this sort of claim has been made quite often. Not so much the goose pimples or goose bumps as I've always known them, but sometimes in the form of welts, scratches, bruises, or red marks. Now, I'm going to save the deep dive on the subject for a later episode. But knowing that might make you feel just a bit better, Cody, knowing that it happened to others. Thank you again for calling in. Now, folks, a quick reminder that you can help the show grow and keep the stories flowing for years to come simply by leaving a rate and review over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you can do such a thing. And you can help by sharing the show with friends and family, posting it to your social media, or shouting it from the roof of your house. Whatever it takes to spread the word that Monsters Among Us is out there collecting and sharing unbelievable paranormal stories. Now, this subsequent call comes to us from my boyhood home of Ohio, in one of my favorite cities in the country. Joe from Cincy. Welcome to the show. Hey, Derek. It's Joe again from Cincinnati, Ohio. Called last week about the experience I had from my house. This one, I think I should tell you because I saw a lot more. I remember a lot more vividly. However, it happened about a decade ago. So... A little bit of background, there's this camp I went to every year because I was a Cub Scout called Camp Ernst, and it started about in the 1920s, is what I heard. Old place, right? And of course, you know, kids being kids, they all had the rumors of the place being weird or haunted, but of course, they're a lot more over the top. However, I think I've had a lot more experiences than I thought I did. I'll tell you about this one. I remember this vividly. It was... I think May, uh, the, the weather was pretty mild. I was maybe nine or 10 years old when this happened. Uh, it was dark. I was getting ready in my cabin, just kind of go to, go to climb into bed on the top bunk. And uh, all of a sudden, I just, this guy just kind of walks into my cabin and stands in the doorway. All I know was a man who was maybe about shorter, and that's all I could make out from him. For some reason, I looked at him and I went, who are you, get out of my cabin. He turned around and left. He did not say a word to me. Not at all. Now, the reason why I find this weird is because if it were a Cub Scout, like a dad from one of the Boy Scouts, I would have either gotten like a, hey, well, calm down. It's just me. Or someone would have told my dad if I was giving him a lip. However, none of this happened. This didn't happen at all. There was no words. Just turned around and walked out. And I guess you could say I have another one, but I'm sure this one could be debunked as like someone who worked here. But uh, this guy, me and my friend were playing around this creek where the water was rushing really, really fast, like really quick. And we thought it was really cool because we'd never seen him before. This guy kind of just came out of nowhere. He was an older guy, tall, lanky, actually kind of expressionless. Basically, all he did was come out to tell us that we shouldn't be out there without an adult. And again, I have no idea where he came from. But that's really it. It's weird. I'm sure that both could be debunked. I really hope you could do something with this. I hope it ends up on your show. I really enjoy it so far. Thank you very much for doing what you do. I appreciate the hell out of it. Uh, again, this is Joe from Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Joe. You know what, Joe? 
I have no idea why. Probably 80s horror movies. But summer camps kind of creep me out. Sarah and I were camping in Sequoia National Forest a decade or so ago. And we were hiking off trail to get to a fishing spot we'd heard of. Hoping to nab a trout or two for dinner. And while we were out there, we stumbled upon a summer camp that was closed for the season. Now I'll admit there was zero reason for me to feel this way. But it too creeped me out a bit. Maybe it was the fact that it was empty. Or like I said, too many horror movies. Why are you still this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we tend to think about all the things we need to do to change our lives, rather than expanding on what we're already doing right. Therapy can help you find your strengths, so you can stop feeling the need to make extreme resolutions, and you can start being kinder to yourself. It can help you dig deep and take time to reflect on what you really want and need, something many of us don't take time to do in the rush of everyday life. Now, a therapy has been on your mind lately. Give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, which makes it convenient, flexible, and affordable. And if for some reason you're not vibing with the therapist you're matched with, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Monsters Among Us today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com, forward slash Monsters Among Us. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show, so thank you for listening. Now back to that jellyfish UFO floating overhead. Now, folks, I'm going to do something a little different here in this episode. Sort of a breaking news segment. Because there are some things paranormal things dominating the news cycle right now and I feel we need to discuss them a bit of course I'm talking about the jellyfish UFO filmed by the United States military over in Iraq in the newly released video you can see what appears to be a jellyfish shaped object with string like tentacles dangling as it glides through a United States joint operations base in Iraq. This video was recorded back in October of 2018. You can see the object going from white to black indicating a change from hot to cold on thermal imagery. While News Nation has not independently verified the authenticity of the video, the UAP was allegedly moving through a sensitive military installation. That clip courtesy of News Nation. And they seem to be the front runner when it comes to all this leaked UFO UAP information. Of course, by way of journalist and documentarian Jeremy Corbell. Now, if you've not yet seen this video, push pause now and go to the show notes and watch it. It's chilling. And because I know many of you won't go look at it, I'll quickly describe what it is I see. Essentially, if you've seen The Empire Strikes Back, the second chronological Star Wars film, and you recall the Imperial probe droid bobbing around the snow drifts in the first ten minutes or so, well, that's what this thing looks like. A bulbous body with four or five limbs or rigid tentacles dangling below it. It floats along, undisturbed, unwavering, at a steady, constant speed. And in this footage, the object in question changes color quickly and drastically, going from black to white in mere seconds. And it's doing so on a thermal camera, no less. Part of the Aerostat program at this particular base, known as the Persistent Threat Detection System. Essentially, it's a series of cameras that hover above the base on a balloon, giving them a high vantage point to watch for oncoming threats. The only camera that was able to pick up this object was the thermal camera. Though in switching from white to black on said camera indicates that the entire object went from cold to hot, back to cold, in the blink of an eye. Something that's unheard of in our current technology. At least in something that scale, it's airborne. But what has me so concerned here is that this object, whatever it is, 
was flying, almost completely undetected, above a military installment. Talk about a security breach. No one seems to know what these things are, where they're coming from, or what their purpose is. So in other words, it's very important that we all take this subject seriously. Our existence may very well depend on it. Now that jellyfish shape that has been reported frequently over the past half dozen or so years. Recently, I heard a captain of a luxury cruise ship share her encounter with something that sounds eerily similar. Here is that experience in her own words. And I had a drone on board, so I thought it would be a nice night to catch a sunset. I had the drone in my hand, and someone said, what's that? And we look up, and there was, it, I put it on TikTok, it looked like a black jellyfish, a gigantic black jellyfish, and it sailed right over the retreat, directly through the center line of the ship, right through our X and our staff, and just floated through. The thing was, we had no wind, maybe five knots at the time, but this thing was cruising along about 10, 15 miles per hour, just cruise right over, and as it passed the, the stern of the ship, it went a couple hundred meters, maybe three to four hundred meters, and then it started to descend into the water. But because it was sunset, we couldn't put a rescue boat down to go see what it was, but it disappeared into the water. And we have no idea. It wasn't a drone. There was no noise associated with it. So if you want to see our UFO, it's on TikTok. Now that was the captain of the Celebrity Edge cruise ship, Kate McHugh, courtesy of cruise tips on YouTube. And if this jellyfish shape sounds familiar to you, that's because it probably should. Because we've featured a few stories over the years that seem to describe the exact same shape and behavior, though a few differences are obvious. Perhaps you recall Tracy's encounter from Season 9, Episode 6. Here is a truncated version. Hi, Derek. My name is Tracy. This was about six years ago. I was leaving my house for work. It's five in the morning. Before I did, I turned off all lights and it's pitch black in the house and it's dark outside. It's around winter time and I always checked out the back to make sure nothing was creeping around there like, you know, people or dogs or anything, coyotes. I looked up in the trees and about 10, 15 feet in the trees, my neighbor's house next to me, the only way I could describe it was it was like an orb about the size of a basketball, dirty yellow, and it was lightly pulsating. And that the very first second, I think maybe the moon, but it wasn't, it was in the tree. And underneath it were like tendrils, short tendrils. And it almost looked like it was underwater the way it floated. And I instantly realized it was strange. So I looked in my house real quick, glanced around. There were no lights on, no reflections, nothing. My cell phone was in my coat pocket. So I looked back out and it was still there, just slowly pulsating. And the tendrils were moving like a jellyfish underwater, you could say, but they were short. And it just slowly faded out. And it wasn't the moon. It wasn't a reflection. To be honest with you, I have no idea what it was. I appreciate you letting me call in and thank you very much. Goodbye or Taylor's entry from a bonus episode. Season 10, episode 19.5. Hey Derek, new listener, a big fan of the show. And this was in 2010. I was actually living in Aruba, which is a small island off the coast of Venezuela. This was during the summer of 2010. I was out on my friend's boat. There was about five or six of us. We were down under the boat and I was on top and I was just laying out on the mat looking up at the stars and something caught my attention in the sky and I kind of focused in on it and when I could see it almost looked like a jellyfish and it almost looked like it was about maybe 500 feet above the boat and it had like a triangle of lights so there was one on the top and then two on the bottom and it was just kind of floating there back and forth maybe after about 10 seconds it just shot up into the sky like, and it was completely gone, never saw it again. You know, I tried to tell all my friends about it. Nobody else saw it. Everyone thought I was kind of crazy, but I know what I saw, and it was definitely some kind of a UFO. And I suppose what might even be the occupants of these strange craft. Where else but in Roswell, New Mexico? This is the description Carrie left on her entry from Season 15, Episode 15. 
Hello, Derek. This is Carrie from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm calling to share about something that happened to me about 35 years ago. I was about eight years old, and my family and I lived in Roswell, New Mexico. I moved back the curtain, and what I saw was a small being. It was about my height, if not a little bit taller, and I got very scared. I drew the curtains closed, and I stood there, and I could still see it glowing. The curtains were a very light, sheer lace. And I got my courage, and I remember pulling the curtain back, and it was like a being that was, if you will, almost the consistency of a jellyfish. I mean, it was see-through. I could see the different uh, organs and vascular system of this being, and it was as interested in me as I was in it. Could all of these calls be depicting the same thing? The same thing captured by a cruise ship captain? Or by military surveillance cameras? Keep your eyes open, folks. Some of the stuff being leaked is downright terrifying. Whatever it is, it seems that we have no control over it. And the very few that might have some information, they're not talking. A big thanks to all of those callers for their entries. And be sure to check out the show notes for all of those visuals. Make rookie mistakes. Do you ever feel like money is just flying out of your bank account? And you have no idea where it's going? Well, I know that feeling. And countless subscriptions play a big role. Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it's endless. But Rocket Money can help you keep it all sorted out so you know exactly what you're spending money on and even helps you cancel the subscriptions you're no longer using. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills. My favorite feature is that I can cancel a subscription with one tap. I don't have to waste time on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money does that for me. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash monsters among us. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash monsters among us. rocketmoney.com forward slash monsters among us. Now, folks, I chose this next entry for a certain listener out there that's battling cancer. And he told me recently that he finds solace in the show and that it helps him take his mind off his extensive treatments and keeps his thoughts positive as he travels great distances to his doctor's. This next entry is for you, Brock. Please welcome Stephanie to the program. Hi, Derek. My name is Stephanie, and I'm calling about something I'd previously decided not to tell anyone, but I've told a few people, and I feel a little bit more comfortable now. This happened back in 2004. It was west of Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, and I saw... A Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. My then husband, now ex-husband for a reason, we were heading backcountry camping near the Bighorn Dam, which is west of Rocky Mountain House. We were meeting some friends there and we're going along this gravel road called the Forestry Trunk Road and we were getting close to the Bighorn Dam. My ex-husband was asleep in the truck in the passenger side And I was driving. And up in the road, about 50 meters ahead, I saw a bipedal Sasquatch run across the road. It was about, I would estimate, between five and six feet tall, so it must have been a juvenile. It was running, and it cleared the road in two strides. Now, I don't know any human that can do that. And so I hit the brakes, and this caused my now ex-husband to wake up. And he kind of woke up 
and I had had the truck stopped and we watched this Bigfoot. It kind of ran into some of the smaller trees that were shorter than it or the same height. But when it went into the darkness of the larger trees, we couldn't see it anymore. I was shocked and I went, whoa, did we just see a, a Sasquatch? And he was started laughing at me, making fun of me. He's like, that was just a person, like, ha, 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 you're so dumb. And so I clammed up and decided not to ever tell anybody. But it's been years now. I've been divorced for years now. And I decided that, you know what, I don't care. I was wide awake. It was broad daylight. And unlike him, I was wide awake and stone sober. And I know what I saw. So I don't care if people call me a liar. I don't care anymore if people make fun of me. I know what I saw. I was always fascinated by Bigfoot and Sasquatch, but after seeing one, it kind of really sparked an interest and I started researching and reading all I could about it and watching shows about it. And it just, I find them really fascinating. And yeah, and I know what I saw. And I don't care if anyone else believes me. Thank you for giving us a space to share our stories without judgment, because that's really important. And that's really helped me to be comfortable to tell my story. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. You're right. A smaller size would suggest a juvenile creature. That, or it could also suggest an average-sized person in a suit. It's something certainly worth considering. That said, you saw it. I didn't. So it's easy for me to come up with alternate explanations. And from what I hear in your story, it seems it really had an effect on you. Whatever you saw was obviously inspiring. And I'll just leave you with this. That part of Canada isn't without its prior reports of the big fella. I've linked to a couple sightings from around the Rocky Mountain House area. And I can't end this segment without mentioning that Rocky Mountain House is only about an hour's drive from a region known for its supposed Sasquatch activity. Nordag, Alberta. So go to monstersamonguspodcast.com and click the show notes tab, or check under the description of this episode's post to learn more. And I'm glad you worked up the nerve to share this entry, Stephanie. As brief as it might have been, I'm extremely jealous that I didn't get to see it as well. Thank you again for sharing the call. Now I have one more call scheduled before the next ad break. And a huge thanks to all of you out there that support our advertisers. Doing so keeps them coming back. And in turn, that supports the show in a huge, huge way. Now, switching gears. If you would, please welcome John from Texas. My name's John. I'm from South Texas. And I have a story that I believe is strange and creepy at the same time. That all takes place at uh, my mom's house back when I was younger. It was just my mom and myself living together. From time to time, she would leave out of town. And I would usually just work from 9 in the morning until I got done doing whatever it is I had to do for my job. Well, this one random night, it was a Saturday night. I believe I was about 19 years old. I was uh, home alone, had the old Xbox playing video games and all that. And it was roughly around seven to eight o'clock. So sun was already down, it was dark outside. And I'm playing my games. And the house that we were living in, it used to be my grandfather's. And when he passed away, he had gave us a house on his will and all that so we took over and the house was pretty old where like the piping was brass like old school brass so only the kitchen sink the bathroom and the toilet was the only thing that had running water everything else was just pretty much just not in use it was a two bed one bath if you were to open up all the doors between the rooms you can pretty much walk in a complete circle without hitting anything. That's how small the house was. They used to have these old school castle looking locks on them where you needed the big old huge key that would be on the big key hooks. We took them out just because they were, we were never using them. 
And along with taking out the one that I had in my room, we damaged the door handle. So for the time being, I had a old shirt just tied up to the door to where I would have to like time it right to where I would throw the door and the shirt together so it would be closed and closed tightly. And again, me being young and dumb, I had uh, clothes on the floor and also, like I said, the piping wasn't all that great. So on the weekends, I would go and do my whole laundry. And the reason why I say this is important later on in the story. So I'm home alone. I'm playing my games. And I start getting this weird sense that something's around me. And I pay no attention to it. And as I'm paying attention to my TV, I tell myself that, you know, getting hungry, let's go make something in the microwave. So I go, start making stuff in the microwave, and I see what I thought was car lights showing up on the wall and just guiding along as if a car was passing by. I walk to the door, open up the curtains, and then I'll see no vehicles or nothing. So, all right, maybe it was just, a reflection of something. I don't mind it no more. Go back to the living room, start playing my games. And in the corner of the room, I start to see this light. And it's kind of flashing. But once I try to look up at it, it goes away. Tend to my game again. And I start to see this flashing light again. But it turns into from a light into like a small little smoke like cloud or something i see it in the corner of my eye and i tell myself you know don't mind it it ain't there it's probably just you're tired or something and as i can keep on focusing on the game i can see it hovering going over the tv now i'm pretty much looking dead at it and once i get up to kind of like see what's going on it disappears so second time it shows itself I'm paying no attention to it so the third time I see it I get up because my fugo was done for the microwave as I walk towards the microwave I open up the microwave and I see the cloud inside the microwave and I just took it as oh well my food's too hot let me just take it out and when I went to go grab the food I just felt like a little small force field kind of like not allow me to actually touch my food and stuff so freaks me out i go outside and i call my brother and i tell him hey dude not too sure if you're busy or not but i need your help and i'm not one to call for people for any type of help unless i truly really need it and even him himself was like dude you sound kind of freaked out all right i'll be there in a little bit so 10 minutes goes by and he comes in and I grab my gains and I'm able to go inside and get my food and everything. And I told him, let me go and make sure all the doors are closed and everything is locked up before I leave. And inside my room, I don't have my window unit on or anything like that. And there's no central in that house. But for some weird reason, it was like, cold like winter cold i get the door and the shirt prepped up and ready to close it so once i do it i make sure that it's nice and tight and even my brother went right behind me to check to make sure everything was closed and locked for me and i go to his house spend the night the next morning i wake up to a phone call that my mom was calling me and she tells me hey did you come in last night and i was like well yeah but i'm here at my brother's house asleep and she tells me, well, why did you leave all the doors wide open? And when kind of shocked me, I was like, no, I know for sure that they were all closed and locked or at least closed. And she said, no, that uh, all of the clothes in my bedroom as well, too, they were all pretty much wet. And I was like, how are they all wet? She's like, oh, well, I don't know. Nothing is turned on. The toilet is not overflowing or anything. She was like, well, just come on back home and gather up all your clothes, go wash them and all that. And I told my brother the same story, and he was like, what the hell? So I've got no idea what uh, what happened when I took off, but any explanations about 
a white cloud or a force field or anything of type of nature like that. If you guys can help me out here and, you know, give me your thoughts, that'd be really appreciated. Thanks, John. No, I'll be straight with you. I have no idea what this might have been. A force field. A cloud inside the house. All the doors standing wide open. And clothing sopping wet. I'm stumped. But, and although I have no real reason to think this, I can't help but think that this might be similar to some of those Glimmer Man experiences we've heard of in the past. It's just a gut feeling that I have. So if you listener know something that I don't, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you again, John, for sharing that entry. Now this next entry originates out of the north as well. Not quite Canada, but the state of Wisconsin. And as I alluded to earlier in the show, this one just might be the most dramatic call I've ever shared on the show. So please, welcome Kate from Wisconsin to the program. Hi there, my name is Kate. I live in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I had a, an encounter with something here in town that I think that you might be interested in. I am not totally sure, and I've actually looked for help for from different people trying to diagnose what it was. Saw. Uh, it was just as COVID had hit, so it was April 2019, and I was walking downtown with my dog. Quarantine had just hit our town, so like the buses weren't running. Nobody was out. I was walking down by the river. It was about 8 o'clock at night. And I was walking somewhere I'm very familiar with. It's downtown by um, Banbury Place, which is kind of a landmark in our, in our city. But I saw a woman walking up this hill. She looked to be like a thousand years old. She was tiny, old, decrepit. And I thought she had cataracts. Her eyes were glowing. And she was carrying this suitcase behind her. And she was walking up this big old hill. Um, I thought that maybe there's like a halfway house down, like right down at the bottom of that hill. And I thought maybe she was like trying to catch a bus, but they weren't running again. Again, the quarantine had just hit our city. So nobody was riding buses, nothing like that. So she was going up this hill and she was looking back at me. And I, that's when I saw her eyes and I was like, oh, shoot, this, this old lady's blind. Like I should help her. And my dog, I have a German Shepherd lab and loyal to a fault she's a wonderful dog but normally you know she might bark at something that would scare her she thought was threatening us she stopped walking with me she didn't want to get any closer to this woman because the woman was walking in the direction i was going and my dog stopped and looked at me like i know dogs can't talk but she said to me essentially like no no we're not going that way that lady looks weird i was like come on dude like this old lady is blind clearly she needs some help carrying the suitcase up this hill. It's a big hill. It's pretty steep. So I kind of dragged my dog along. She was very hesitant. And I saw this woman, again, beckoning me almost with her eyes. She would turn around and look at me. And I saw her blind ass eyes. And then she turned back and keep walking up the hill. And I, and I started saying, hey, ma'am, ma'am, can I help you? Hello. And she didn't hear me. She kept walking. She almost sped up a little bit. And I was like, hello, hey, ma'am, can I help you? I, I can help you with your suitcase. And I'm not f***ing kidding. She turned back at me one more time. Eyes were glowing. They were green. And she, I, I know this sounds insane, but that suitcase that she was carrying turned into front legs and her legs turned into back legs and her head. It all kind of like, it, I, I know I sound insane. I'm so sorry. But she kind of morphed into this. It was a moose without antlers like it was the size of a moose that she had to have been at least 10 feet tall she just became this thing and jumped off into the like there's like a little i don't know like where the hill like meets the land i don't know it was, i don't know how i don't know it really screwed with me but i swear to god 
her body and her head became the front and that suitcase became either her front or back legs. I don't remember exactly. And it seems like everything stopped for just a second. She turned into this moose thing and jumped off into the trees. And I stopped for a second. I was like, holy shit, I need to go to a doctor. There's something wrong with me. And I looked at my dog and I made the split decision just to run as fast as I could. I was heading home, which was up in the direction that she was. So I had to run up the hill where that woman was and I could hear her crashing through the trees. I was hauling ass. I was trying to run home. I had maybe six, seven, eight blocks or so to run up this hill and then run to where I lived with my boyfriend and my son. And the whole time I'm thinking I have to call a doctor as soon as I get home, like there's something wrong with me. I just imagined something, but my dog saw it. And I'm running as fast as I can. And this truck comes screeching up behind me. Once I hit the top of the hill and I turn towards my house on the street that my house was on, this truck comes screeching up behind me, slams on the brakes. And this dude says, hey, I saw it too. Run as fast as you can. I'll keep it off as long as I can. And then I didn't even have a chance to even like, I was huffing and puffing. I'm not in the best shape, so I can't run, but I was hauling ass. So he's like, hey, I'll keep it off. And then screeched off and he was honking his horn, just beep, 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 beep around my neighborhood. He drove past me two times, like just driving around my neighborhood at at mock speed. He said, I'll keep it off as long as I can get home, whatever. So I ran, I was sobbing. I was so worried that this thing was going to follow me home. And I had a a one-year-old son at the time and I was terrified and I had to let go of my dog's leash at this point. She was just running right, right next to me. She was terrified too. And I, I don't know, I guess when I, I'm sorry for crying, but when that guy pulled up, I was like, like somebody else saw that? Like it wasn't just me? I just ran as fast as I could. And I kept hearing him honking around the neighborhood. And then he like drove past me and I was, I was running into my driveway. And I saw my boyfriend because he came out to say, hey, what is going on? Somebody's honking a lot. And I was like, dude, I can't even start to explain what happened. And I tried and he, he was like, get inside. And I, I didn't leave my house for probably like, I went outside once within like three days. Um, I was terrified and I like uh, the first thing I did is I ran upstairs and made sure my son was okay. I had no idea what was going on. But I made sure my one-year-old was still safe in bed and he was. My boyfriend stood guard. Like I was so shook. And he believed me. He believed every word I said. And so then we left the house. Like I finally like got in the car and we went to go, I don't know, like decompress. We went to a park or something. And we drove past where it happened. And all those trees like that I heard crashing down were broken in half. Like something had driven through there. Like something had crashed through there. Like I'm really not making this up. I didn't imagine it. This is real. And like I wasn't drunk. I wasn't on any drugs. I was just walking my dog. I had made that walk probably over 500 times. You know, I'd always walk her at night and I'd do the same route every single time. So I know what the trees look like. Nothing ever weird like that has ever happened. But when we drove by and I saw those trees that were like, literally like split in half I was a little shook I don't know I like I'm still trying to find some peace with it but I haven't had anything happen since I just wanted to say I didn't know what it was and my boyfriend who believed me immediately he saw how shook I was you know I followed up with as many medical professionals as I could without sounding insane but like I was fine I was totally coherent sober and um, my boyfriend believed me and he like looked into it and said that you know he saw like a like a, something on Reddit that said skinwalker and I didn't know I had never even heard of them before but then when he described like kind of some of the recollections that he had seen on this subreddit he said it sounds like a lot like this and they're scary they will follow you I did not see the woman or the moose again. 
but like a bunch of really weird stuff happened at our house after that and we moved out pretty shortly after i don't know i I can't really explain it but it wasn't safe it didn't feel safe um we had a neighbor who lit his house on fire as i was literally standing right there trying to talk to him we had somebody flip a car flip their car on our little tiny residential neighborhood street after i had gotten this weird feeling like that place is haunted as hell it's certainly not the first and it more than likely won't be the last encounter I've had, but that's definitely the most stark, like visceral interaction I've had with something that I could I could not explain. I do not know what to tell you. I don't know what it was. I know I didn't make it up, and I still to this day don't know how to explain it. I haven't had any encounters with it again, and I felt bad for it actually. And what my boyfriend told me was that. What he read up on was that if you run away in fear or something from some, some sort of creature like this, and they might attack you, they might kill you, they might hurt you. But I offered it kindness because I thought it was this lady that needed help. And I insisted on being like, ma'am, can I help you? And it, I scared her or it or whatever it is. So he's pretty staunch on the fact that he believes that I scared it with kindness, which is great. But now it took me a really long time to ever feel comfortable again. I'm good now, but I, I don't know. I've tried to seek help, but I don't really know where to start. So I tried to talk to a few of the native tribesmen or women around our area, and uh, they won't talk about it. They refuse. So I don't. I don't know what to do. I hope that you have a good day, and thank you for listening to my story. Bye. Unbelievable. Thank you, Kate, for sharing that story. It was obvious to all of us how difficult it was to revisit those events. And it's obvious to me why it would be that way. And truthfully, I don't even know where to begin on this one. I guess I should start by saying that, yeah, moose do exist in Wisconsin. Although, they are rare as evidenced by this WISN ABC News 12 clip. All right, take a look at this. We have a rare moose sighting in northern Wisconsin. This picture coming from the State Department of Natural Resources. You see it there. I mean, they posted this photo on Saturday, but the image was actually captured by a trail camera in June. It's the first confirmed sighting of a moose in the state this year. Hmm. Now, they might live in the area, but we all know there was more to this encounter than just a moose on the loose. Right. After all, Kate's claims are extraordinary. She claims she saw a tiny old woman turn into a large moose. Then that moose went berserk through a grove of trees. That's not normal animal behavior. And the fact that there were three witnesses to this event lends mountains of credence. Kate, the truck driver, and her dog all saw and reacted to the figure. And let me tell you, I'd love to get that trucker's side of the story. If he's listening or you happen to know who he is, reach out to me, please. This whole story is just wild. And Delaney and I both spent considerable time thumbing through our personal libraries and surfing the web. I even reached out to two Wisconsin stables in the paranormal field. Adam Benedict and Tobias Wayland, both of whom are excellent authors worth checking out. But neither of them had much to share on the subject. They were just as stomped as Delaney and me. However, we were able to discern this. There are two cultures that are local to the area that hold the moose in high regard. The Ojibwe tribe of Native Americans and the Sami people whom had immigrated there from parts of Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Russia. Both groups lived off the moose, and both had legends about the animal. And both even have tales in their history of supernatural people with moose heads and or limbs. A sort of moose-human hybrid, if you will. But nothing even close to what Kate described. So that's it. That's really all we could find. So I'll leave this up to the listeners, I suppose. 
Do any of you have any suggestions as to what this might have been? Know of a similar legend? Experience something like this yourself? Well, we're all ears over here. Email me at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. And I'm not sure what to tell you to do to get help with this, Kate. But I'll do some looking around some more and see if I can find some relief for you. In the meantime, 2019 wasn't all that long ago. Maybe the trees are still broken around the area where the woman turned moose ran through, crashing through the vegetation. So if you're feeling up to it, Kate, maybe you can wander back over there and snap a few photos for us. I would love to see some of the damage it caused, and or the area where this all went down. Until then, thank you again, Kate, for the gnarly call. That's not something you hear about every day, and I'm sorry that the experience has taken such a toll on you. But we really do appreciate you sharing it here with us. Now folks, that's going to do it for this episode. At least for a small portion of you. Everyone else stick around until after the outro and the ad for more Monsters Among Us content. And don't forget to visit our merch shop at monstersamonguspodcast.com and then by clicking on the shop tab, pick up a hat, tote, shirt, poster, pin, patch, whatever. There's a whole lot of stuff there that you can buy to support your favorite podcast. And on an unrelated note, don't forget that you can catch a screening of our film, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle, on Sunday, February 25th, 2024, at 1 p.m. at Cinema Nova in Melbourne, Australia. Just visit tonight's show notes or borregotriangle.com for more information. Now, Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support was provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And please, if you have it in your heart, take some time to give us a rate and review. Then follow us on social media and hop on over to YouTube for a like, comment, and follow. Don't forget you can catch the show every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern on the Unax Network Digital Radio. And finally, tonight's score was provided by Co.AG Music, Armchair Ambiance, and Carl Casey and White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to hanging out with you again next week. Until then, you keep it spooky. Have a good night. Now tonight's secret entry is another in a long line of weird and unusual calls, which is exactly what I like to play here in this secret entry slot. So without further ado, please welcome Zach to the show. Hey Derek, this is Zach. I am uh, calling in about a uh, kind of an interesting encounter. I don't know if I call it an encounter. I'm not sure. I kind of played this off when I was a kid, kind of like I had, had imagined it. But um, it's kind of two different experiences. We were living in California at the time in uh, Loma Linda. This street right in front of our house was a huge poplar tree. Love that house. Um, always felt safe there. Really didn't feel any kind of weariness or strangeness apart from this one kind of interesting night. But I was uh, six or maybe seven at the time. I believe it was probably around 2000, 2001. I had woken up in the night. I don't really remember actually waking up, feeling what I felt, but I had woken up and kind of went over to my mom and dad's room, kind of freaked out. 
And I remember as I was walking down the hallway, my room had faced their room down this hallway. And in the middle of this hallway, there was another hallway leading to the kitchen, kind of like a T. And so as I was walking down the hallway, I remember looking down the hallway toward the kitchen. And right as I did that, I remember seeing this person, this uh, uh, thing that looked like it was kind of rummaging through things. But the weird thing about this person or this thing is that it was kind of looking like orange static, head to toe. I didn't see any clothing. I didn't really see any features on this individual, but I remember seeing it and it looked like orange static, kind of almost like orange swirling static. I remember kind of seeing lines and I can see it clear as day right here in my eyes. (laughs) It's pretty strange. But the frightening thing that happened is as I'm walking down this hallway and I'm looking down to the kitchen, right as I looked at it, this thing turned around and looked directly at me. Again, I didn't really see any features. It just looked like orange static or orange energy. And it bolted right after me. And I just remember looking right toward my parents' room, bolting it in there and slamming the door shut. Uh, probably midnight <laughs> again I was six or seven nothing happened after that but I wanted to call that experience and because you've been having a ton of mirrored men experiences with people calling in and in the interview that you did with your friend recently and I wanted to call it in because I did have another experience I believe it was shortly after this but but days after this experience maybe a couple weeks where I was sitting at the edge of my parents bed and it was evening time The sun was going down. You could kind of tell that it was starting to get dark outside. And I was sitting at the edge of my parents' bed, and I had blinked, and it was morning. And I was in the same exact position. And that that experience, I remember to this day, similar with the other experience in the kitchen, or looking at the kitchen, the energy static man or whatever. And after hearing some of these other encounters and experiences that others have shared about seeing mirrored men, and then shortly thereafter, after being recognized or being noticed by these by these men, blinking and waking up. Um, and kind of inter- interesting that that kind of maybe days apart, but kind of had happened to me. Anyway, that's my story. I really appreciate the podcast. Love it. I've binged it since season four. <laughs> Love it. But thank you, Derek. Have a good night. Thank you, Zach. Now, I have heard of similar encounters. I don't recall hearing about the orange hue, however, but plenty of quote-unquote static men reports submitted over the years. But that orange tint did, however, pique my interest, and I figured it's an attribute that would stick out like a sore thumb and should make it easy to find a similar account. And after a brief search, my suspicions were confirmed. The following written account was posted on the paranormal subreddit by Young S. Modulus and goes as follows. When I was 10 years old, I saw a silhouette of a person, except it wasn't a shadow person. It wasn't black. There was no sense or sounds coming from it. It looked like it was made of orange static, kind of like when you change the TV to a dead channel and it does that snow effect except orange color. I could tell it just watched me until I fell asleep at night. It didn't touch me or try to talk to me. It just watched. I never saw it again after that, and my parents never actually believed me. So there you go, Zach. You're in good company. And as for the mirrored men connection, I'm not so sure I see it. But it's hard to ignore that missing time element. So either way, Thank you again, Zach, for calling in. Now, folks, it's time to go beyond. The After Show found exclusively at Patreon.com. $5 a month gets you access to this bonus content plus well over 100 hours of additional work. And if you're on a budget, $1 a month will get you the main content ad-free. Visit our website, MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com, and click the Patreon tab to learn more because it's in the beyond that you can hear stories like Jack's from Bart's Unknown. Hey Derek, this is Jack. 
Long time listener, love the show, keep up the good work. The reason I'm calling in is I've been binge listening to your episodes, currently sitting in season seven, but every time I hear something relating to the triangle-shaped UFOs, it jolts a memory. This isn't a first-hand account, but I grew up in Southern...